it's a funny thing. Mitzi, I can give you three bullet points today about little factoids and so forth, and you would not remember them by the end of the show. But you probably heard the story of the tortoise of the hare and the hare when you were seven, and you could probably repeat it to me right now. That's the power. Uh, that's the Velcro hold that stories have on uh, the way we organize our information and the way we internalize it. So my delivery system, in the same way that a cigarette is really just a delivery system for nicotine, my stories are just a delivery system for a message that people aren't as bad as you're being told. And if we stick together, life is a team sport. Life is a team sport. And we should see people as they could be. We should be able to visualize the potential and treat people as such when we're speaking with them. This episode is brought to you by the Rich Thinking Conference, taking place in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on September 6, 2024. Get in the right rooms with the best people and hear some amazing speakers. Get your tickets at richthinking.org. Welcome back to Blessings, friends. Since I have become a more seasoned traveler in the world of online media, the algorithms have picked up on my attraction to a unique sort of intellectual, I like academic types with a wit and a certain sensitivity to the roller coaster that the world seems to have involuntarily strapped us all onto over the past few years. And that is how I first came across my guest today, Neil Ford, storyteller extraordinaire. Neil prides himself on noticing things that are, as he says, amazing about being alive. And this way of life lights me up and I find myself on a similar path, which is why I cannot wait to get inside his brain today. I love the way Neil uses language. He makes me want to write. Maybe that's the professor in me. And his choice of words and his way of seeing things helps people to grow new eyes and new ears as they interact with his colorful descriptions and compelling retellings. He can make a chance conversation into a meaningful metaphor, the kind that causes you to walk through life differently, yearning to have these kinds of experiences yourself. And also, he drives a car. He's named Angel. And you can and you should listen to the audiobook Rancho Madhammer on his website to hear more about this. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Neil Ford. Thank you. Wow. Mitzi, that is so cool that you knew about my car. Um, which I'm very proud of. I love that little thing. I have a, some for your listeners, a Scion XB of the original generation. It's just a little box on wheels. And I had bought it as a disposable car that I would get rid of once I left New Jersey, only to discover that it's, I've loved that thing more than anything I've ever driven. So I continue. We, was, we shall go on together. Isn't that the way? I think that could probably be applied to other things in life as well. I, yes. <laughs> An un, unexpected loyalty. Yes. Yes. I love that. And I also find it interesting that you left New Jersey. I also left New Jersey. So we oh. have that in common as well. <laughs> lived for eight years Not in Wayne. Not because there was anything wrong. Where did you live? In Wayne. In uh, Wayne. Oh, okay. Yeah, sort of. I used I to lived... take the Montclair Booten line out from Manhattan. Yep. Everywhere. And I was a professor at Montclair State University. Oh, and <laughs> oh. we used to go watch the Jackals play at, <laughs> at Montclair State. The I never did that. Stadium. Yeah. I've got a whole That's story so about that. Oh, I all right. I love that. That's so great. Yeah. yeah. Montclair is so great. The university, the town, everything yeah. about it. But yeah, I did not very... live in Montclair. I lived in a little rural area of New Jersey called Newton out in Sussex County. Okay. And anyway, That's... it was very beautiful there. And I didn't leave for any other particular reason just to. Yeah. People don't know how, how gorgeous <laughs> Jersey is. How, it really how is. Sylvan and lush and how like Vermont it is without many of the mud problems. Yeah, it's a beautiful place. It's got yeah. a lot of variety. Anyway, I am really pleased to see that you are wearing a hat. I heard that you were a fan of hats, so I wore a hat for you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I Queen wanted to know, <laughs> what does this hat say about me? It's the Queen of Hearts. So depending on how familiar you are with Alice in Wonderland, it could represent a sort of sinister side to you. Oh my of, gosh. You know what? Of, but on the other hand, it's beautiful and slow weathered. It's gone pink, used to be red, but it's gone pink. So it it looks rather um, appropriate for Valentine's Day and spring in general. Isn't that funny? I never considered that the duality of the Queen of Hearts. Wow. And I do think that's me in a lot of ways. 
<laughs> okay. Yeah. I want to start out with a big question. All right. And then we're going to dig a little bit into what has brought you to be who you are today and gotten to this place. But I like to start with something big because it gets the wheels turning. What is it that you think, after all your experiences, makes a person unstoppable? I think that it, I would say it's about the mission that you're on. And that as long as you are in love with the mission, the, you will take pleasure in the process and therefore not focus on the end result. And in doing so, over the course of your experience, achieve great things. Um, there is a certain love affair that the great ones, whether it is uh, athletes or business people, they have a love affair with the process. And you know how you'll you'll come across somebody like a Steve Jobs or particularly like uh, Mark Bezos. And you, it, to me, it's, I'm thinking, Mark, why are you not taking advantage of this vast wealth you have accumulated to do marvelous and wonderful things in the world, to solve problems that only you can solve? Because he doesn't really, it's not about the money. The money is merely a byproduct of his passion for his business. He, no doubt he'll keel over without having really spent any of it, mm -hmm. except on rockets. But what I mean to say is he is only emblematic to me of a larger principle which is when you are invested in the process, when you love, like an artist, you love the process of making movies so much, you're just going to keep doing it no matter what the budgets are, down to a nickel. That's my sense of an answer for your question. That's beautiful. I think you mean Jeff, first of all, oh, right? <laughs> what, what did I say? <laughs> you said Mark, but that's okay. Mark Bezos, <laughs> Mark Bezos is his Persian cousin. who There uh, is a Mark Bezos out there somewhere. And uh, then no listening. doubt. <laughs> and Right, and he's calling his lawyer right now. I've been slammed. Um, no, I think that's great. And I, I love what you said about the mission and that being more tied to the process because we think mission as end game rather than process. So you just flipped the narrative on that for me. And that was beautiful. So thank you. Right on. All right. Can you, let's go back a little bit in your life and just talk about some of the things that kind of made you who you are today. I was wondering if you have a story about your earliest or a very early memory in your life? The things I remember most vividly are the sweet things people did for each other. I think I try to shut out the memories that are unpleasant, not out of a kind of an aversion like a PTSD, but just I'd like to go through life thinking that people are okay. And the evidence is abundant all around us, but I'll give you a great example of one of these cases where this is a childhood memory. I had a friend. We, we used to live in this neighborhood where it was a very, it was a very wealthy suburb of Oakland, of San Francisco. Oakland was a kind of sleeping bag for San Francisco. And we were on the fringe of it. And in our particular neck of the woods, there were these two families that were both, they had lots of kids and no money. And one of them, one of the kids was the last kid in the long line. And he always used to wear the hand-me-down clothes from his older siblings. And he had these blue jeans that he would always wear cuffed up because he'd inherited from an older brother. He, he would cuff them so that as he got bigger, he would be able to unspool the cuff. And, but it finally got to the point where, you know, he was thickening up to the point where he couldn't, couldn't wear these jeans anymore. One day we're painting a fence together. We got a couple of bucks from a neighbor to paint this green fence. So we're out there and he gets a big blotch of this green paint on the cuff. And he is mad as a wet hen. He just threw a rod. And I'm thinking, why are you so upset? Jeez, it's, it cut the cuffs off. You're last in line. Nobody's going to, it's not like you got to hand them down to anybody else. But he was just mad enough to bite a radiator. And I couldn't understand his fury until... Later, much later, when the two of us had grown enough to where the pants were a long gone memory. And on the playground one day, I saw one of the kids from the other family wearing those jeans. And I thought, oh, that's why he was so angry. He'd spoiled the pants that were going to belong to somebody else. And he didn't want to embarrass that kid for wearing something people could ID as being a hand-me-down. That's, that that's what had made him upset was that he was going to put some other kid in the firing line. 
of what he went through. And I thought, that's a class act. People are like that. I, I think at a very young age, you can spot them. They'll do nice things for other people. They'll be conscious of other people's suffering or potential suffering. And you got a lot more than you might think. One of the reasons I lament our media is how much it, it despoils our impression of other human beings. Courtesy of reality TV, they have discovered that a parade dimwits is popular because it's watching a train wreck when we all love the spectacle of morons in traffic. And unfortunately, it makes people feel like this is A, this is how most people are. And B, this is the kind of behavior that's expected of you, which is, it's simply not true. We're being fed a steady diet of conflict and anger, rage, dimwits. There are, it's profitable to have us at each other's throats. And, but that's not my personal experience. My personal experience is, yes, of course, there are bullies, but there are also an abundant series of examples of people being quite good to one another. I'll give you an example of what I mean, Mitzi. If you were to take an inventory of how many people you encountered in traffic on any given day, and I'm out here in LA, so it's thousands, thousands and thousands. One simple trip on the 405, and you have encountered tens of thousands of people. How many of them are rage-inducing dirtbags? Maybe one or two, right? In other words, the percentage is less than 0.001 okay to dirt bags it's and yeah, yet right. <laughs> yeah it's a, so in other words that's a pretty good batting average that yeah. most of us and most 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 of us are pretty good in traffic and not swerving across four lanes without signaling that's pretty rare it happens but there's no reason to get upset about it because the proportion is so low so this is my when you were asking before about what where am i at where what was the early memories it's, I have a few of those examples of people being really nice and in both small and large ways. And that's and what stands I, out to you from your childhood and from. Yeah. Your it's what I choose to observe and remember. Why do you do that? I had a temper problem. If anything could send me into a red mist, it was watching somebody get picked on to the point of a murderous rage. And if you don't get that under control, it can lead to very bad places. So the, the aspirin tablet is to just remember the reality of how sweet people are and to not be focused on people being mean. There's lots of examples of that. I, the thing that sort of disturbs me a little bit is that indeed our news media is not doing its diligence of representing a cross section of the wonderful things people do with each other. There's something just absolutely wonderful about business. I almost wish we didn't call it business, but we returned to what we used to call it back in the days of the caravans across the Silk Road. They called it trade, mm. right? They didn't call it business. They called it trade. And trade signifies an exchange, yeah, give, and take. A give and take. And it also signifies relationships mm -hmm. that you that trust was a very valuable commodity. That if you had relationships of trust, you never had to get lawyers involved. You could trade and you could increase your mutual wealth and wealth in more than its monetary sense, and the enrichment of other cultures. One of the absolutely awesome things about a place like Manhattan or Los Angeles is they are crossroads of cultures and every kind of cuisine, every kind of music. When I was in high school, I was searching desperately for a, t a genre of music for my high school. I had a band in high school. We were terrible, but I was always on the hunt for a genre that we could play that would make us happy. And only when I got into college did I finally discover ska music, which to me was the absolute mother load. It was impossible not to be happy while you were doing this ridiculous sort of Jamaican polka. And the, the, I wish I had been more exposed to the other to the crossroads of music so I would have caught it sooner and been able to participate in it more. But this is the beauty of being any kind of very large metro. People are not when people think of Los Angeles, I don't think they're fully aware of how many subcultures there are here. It is not one city. 
it's 65 subcultures, and that's probably being <laughs> tight-fisted about it. You can go to Westminster or Garden Grove and literally be in Vietnam. It's little Saigon, and all the signs are in Vietnamese. It's fantastic to have pho down there, right? And then you can go to little Ethiopia. You can go to little Tokyo. Oh, Los Angeles, Koreatown is a wow. And then there's the West Side surf culture in the South Bay. And there's the, you get the idea, right? It's just endless. Los Angeles is a Spanish speaking city of 4 million. You can speak nothing but Spanish your whole life in Los Angeles if you want. But the beauty of what, how Spanish culture has affected the Angelinos is fantastic. Not just the food, but there's a deliciousness to this sort of patois, the Spanglish that gets spoken here. It's really quite beautiful and lyrical and musical. And I wish people were more open to really making that part of their existence is to expose themselves and embrace other cultures. And just think about how wonderful it, it makes life if you are, if rather than fear outsiders or typecast them as a certain type that you're going to no, know, trust me, whether it's Arabic or Philippines or what have you, you will benefit from your exposure to these people's cultures, their language. It, what we always used to say to each other when I worked at this lumber yard in South Central LA, we always used to say to each other, what do you think you are? What nationality do you think you are spiritually? Like, you look like an Anglo-Saxon to me, but I think you're really Mexican. Because look at all the food you eat. You love Mexican food. You speak Spanish beautifully, but I'm looking at you and I'm, you might as well be German, but I don't think that's where you are spiritually. I think you're, and we always used to laugh about that thinking. I could actually, Johnny Jones, he's African-American, but he's got such a thing for Filipino food. You know, I think we all have. So instead of, of your spirit animal, maybe we have a spirit culture. Well, I think, yeah, there's a kind of spirit culture. There's something that you vibe with, you have a simpatico with without really being aware. That's the way that your internal winds blow in that direction. Do, if you were going to guess for yourself what it might be, what culture do you think you vibe with? For me, I vibe with Eastern cultures, Indian, Hindu cultures, yeah, or Buddhist kind of those kind of parts of the world where yeah. that philosophy of interdirectedness, but also collective connection is mm. a prominent theme. And I'm yes. also very peaceful, very, very, I'm very. Okay. <laughs> So I think I one know. of those cultures would be Wonder, my spirit I, culture. My guess is that the, the more we get, the, the greater we understand about energy vibrations, as in string theory and subatomic vibrations of energy, the less woo-woo it sounds, the more it just sounds like you, what you're representing is a phenomenon that's quite real, but has yet to have a sufficiently understandable scientific explanation to understand where it's coming from. The, that you get subsonic signals from people about their attitudes and whether or not you should fear them and et cetera. And unfortunately we don't get, life doesn't come with theme music. We don't, and we're not at the ATM hearing the sinister sounds of a, the psycho soundtrack when there's somebody standing behind us. So we don't know that they're a threat. And then likewise, you never, swelling violins don't play when you potentially meet the love of your life. It, we survive off of other signifiers. And I've been told by reliable sources that romantic relationships are often the result of people's attraction to each other's smell mm -hmm. and that we are not sufficiently giving credit to the fact that the pheromonal signature you give off actually is a signifier of your immune system and that men and women are often attracted to one another's smell when they've sweated because their immune system is telling you this would be a good mate for having healthy progeny. And mm -hmm. for my part, I don't think you should call it woo. I think you should just acknowledge that there are <laughs> some frontiers that do have explanations, but perhaps don't, we don't know yet. To this yeah. day, I'm given to understand they don't even still understand why aspirin works. They can't figure out what the physiology about why it does what it does. It doesn't mean it doesn't work. When you were talking about the cultures that you vibe with, South Asian, um, East Asian, it's what's fascinating to me are the differences between, say, Thai culture and Sri Lankan. There's a there's just oceans of difference. And as the crow flies, 
it's really not that big a distance. But I think what we, um, what's nice is that you have exposed yourself enough to the other cultures to have opened up a new side of understanding mm-hmm. that yeah. I do think we don't have sufficient, in our culture, we don't sufficiently emphasize the opportunity as an American to experience a larger painting than the one that's right in front of our face. I, mm-hmm. I, I had the experience of living in Hong Kong for two years. Mm. And when I was there, one of my best friends was, he was an English writer, but he was Chinese. He was ethnically Chinese and he was born in Hong Kong. But he was one of these world citizens whose great fascination was Italy. And he, he took me in one day into a Hong Kong bookstore that was famous for its design books. It had rows and rows of design books. And he says, I discovered something today that I think you'll get a kick out of. Before I show it to you, I want to ask you, if we were to go into this design section and choose who, who has the most real estate in here, Japanese design, Italian design, German design, Chinese design, American design, et cetera, who would you say occupies the most real estate? And I thought, oh, it's got to be Japanese design. The Hong Kong Chinese are crazy about Japanese design. He goes, No. And I go, is it the Italians? He goes, no. He goes, that's what I thought. And then he shows me. And as we were going through the bookshelves, okay, there was this much for the Germans, not very much. And then there was, not that the Germans aren't great designers. It's just that there wasn't much shelf space. And then there was this much for Chinese. As you would expect, it was quite large because China's a very big country and it has different versions of it. The easily 60% bigger than anybody, everybody else's was the American design section. And I, I went, What? And he said, yeah, because you can't put your finger on it. American design comes from so many influences. Yeah. It is the great crossroads. It's the great mashup. And mashup is the, it's the secret to new ideas. And I thought, I don't think Americans are taking sufficient pride in the right things. I wow. think they need to take more pride as Americans in the fact that to us, it's just everyday experience to be exposed to Korean and Vietnamese and Sri Lankan. And and there's a difference between New Delhi and Mumbai. It's not just, and then there's Burmese and there's a vast difference between Persian and Arabic. And you can find them here in Los Angeles or New York or Dallas or Seattle. And what is not the pure, you don't see it pure. You see the Mm -hmm. Americanized version of it, which is awesome. And if we were to celebrate and embrace that to be American is to be exposed on a con- constant basis to a roiling stew, uh, I think we would be taking pride in the right things, the creativity of the country, the adaptability of the country. And mm-hmm. instead, we take pleasure in, I don't know, I don't know what Americans take pleasure in that I'm just fascinated by the opportunity sitting right in front of us that I think we ought to take more advantage of. I agree. We have so many opportunities. And I love what you said about the idea of open-mindedness and how that leads us to connection and all of these wonderful things that we should be embracing and how that's what you choose to look at. And I want to touch base on something that I heard you say, and you just referred to it again, is you have this big presence on TikTok, which is where I found you. You also have a big presence, I'm sure, on other social media, but that's where I found you because it's the platform where you're able to really showcase yeah. your stories, right? It's well, it, yeah. it, and TikTok tends to uh, send you out to people that it, it wants right. to test whether you like it or not. It, it yes, does so yeah. much more than Instagram, much more than YouTube. Yeah. Yes. And you said that the people who, and that's what I, where you're talking about the energetic alignment. I really do believe in that. And I know I made a joke about being, but yes, I'm very interested in neuroscience, epigenetics, and all of those things in that new world of quantum mechanics and quantum physics that are just coming into the forefront mm-hmm. or I guess coming more mainstream. But you talked about TikTok as being a place where you your niche of the world, your brothers and sisters can find you with alignment. And I'm one of those people that found you. I believe that we are meant to have this conversation today because you were someone who I just didn't know at all. And then found out that we had a mutual connection and that's how we came together. And that's how serendipity Mm. works. But you said that your goal was to be an aspirin tablet 
for people who are sick of the state of the world. And you've alluded to a lot of those things that about the world that we wish were different or that we would like to make different. And you also talked about how we don't know why aspirin works, but it works. Huh. And you want to be that for people. So how are stories medicine? There's this, are you familiar? I know you are. Victor Frankl, the, oh, uh, the author of, of uh, Man's Search for Meaning. He gave a talk in Ottawa, I think, and this would have been about, say, 1969 or 68. And what he talked about was that even at his late age, by then he was in his 70s, and he had this very pronounced Austrian accent. He starts his speech by saying, you'll excuse me, as you can hear, I have a marvelous, he goes, I have, I'm speaking in perfect accent with very little English. And, and he describes how he was taking flying lessons even at his age. And he said that he learned this fascinating technique, which pilots call crabbing, which is that when you are flying from one spot to a destination, no doubt there will be crosswinds. It's the, you're, the wind is going to be trying to blow you off course almost the entire journey. So what you do is something called crabbing which is that you compensate by moving, you direct the plane to the side of the target repeatedly, grabbing again and again. And in doing so, by shooting too far this way, you will eventually wind up at your destination. And he said, the metaphor of this to the human experience is that you cannot simply treat someone as they are. You do not do that any more than you would simply allow them to fly while the winds blow them off course. What he means is that if you treat someone as they are in a society that has no particular, that does not have elevated expectations for you, and if I don't compel you to be your best self, to rise above your own expectations for yourself, you will never arrive at your intended destination. You will not overcompensate sufficiently to put you exactly who you could be. And I'm botching it slightly, but he said, and it wasn't the pilot that came up with this, and it certainly wasn't me. It was the German philosopher Goethe who said, if I treat you as you are, you will be a disappointment. But if I treat you as you could be, you will wind up living up to your own best self. My goal is to present that side of us that I know we are all capable of. Almost as much, Mitzi, I do it as much to hear the words coming out of my mouth for myself as anybody. I need to hear these words coming out of my mouth so I remember to, to be as better than I, than I can sometimes display. And in doing so, I wonder whether... I'm not trying to dull anybody's pain. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to be part of, I guess you might even call it a kind of civil disobedience. The system, I don't think that there's a bunch of evil people at the networks and online, except for maybe the troll farms. But I think it's simply that they've discovered that inciting rage is so profitable that they excuse themselves from the, the duty to stop. And so what I'm trying to do is be civilly disobedient and that I'm not going to follow, I'm not going to follow the clicks and the likes and the traffic. I'm just going to put this out there in the hope that like a seed, it'll hit a certain kind of soil and then sprout. And I don't think of myself as anything particularly. It's funny to be on a show like yours because you're looking for interesting guests, but I'm just on a mission, come what may. It's, it, trust me when I tell you, there's no profit in it so far. It doesn't make any money, but I find great satisfaction in it, knowing that um, people will hear the message and they'll go, you know what, that does actually, that sounds about right. And by the way, just when it comes to why stories, as opposed to just telling people the statistics and so forth, mm -hmm. and that is that stories are the human operating system. It's how we remember everything that over, over the course of a hundred thousand years of sitting around campfires, we this is how we take in and remember information as a species. And it's just so much easier to understand a moral after having heard a story because we can place ourselves in that story. We can play the role. It's a funny thing. Mitzi, I can give you three bullet points 
today about little factoids and so forth. And you would not remember them by the end of the show. But you probably heard the story of the tortoise of the hare and the hare when you were seven. And you could probably repeat it to me right now. That's the power. Uh, that's the Velcro hold that stories have on our, the way we organize our information and the way we internalize it. So my delivery system, in the same way that a cigarette is really just a delivery system for nicotine, my stories are just a delivery system for a message that people aren't as bad as you're being told. And if we stick together, life is a team sport. Life is a team sport and we should see people as they could be. We should be able to visualize the potential and treat people as such when we're speaking with them. Yeah. Pygmalion effect. That yep. You you set an expectation for somebody in a good way. There's a dark side to it too, which is- That's what I was going to ask you. Can that come back to bite you in the butt? Let's say you're a, you're the kind of parent who has expectations that you're child is going to be president of the United States. And if they never achieve that, then somehow they spend their entire life in misery trying to make you happy when you're impossible to please. Or indeed they do achieve whatever it is that you have set out for them and, and still they feel empty for some reason. There's this great Kurt Vonnegut quote, which is the meaning of life, no matter who controls it, is to love whoever is close by to be loved. And this is our obligation to one another is I will think well of you until you disappoint me. But until that time, mm. I will, I would rather give you the opportunity to, if you set an expectation for somebody that you don't have any, uh, you don't have any particularly good expectations for them. They'll live up to that too. That's true. But I have been disappointed by people at times when I have given them the benefit of the doubt. And that's um, hard. There's a, can I tell you something that happened to me just today? Yes. I'm supposed to be doing these Lexus videos, which it, they're just delightful clients. They really are. And I really, I want to do a fantastic job for them. But some jackass sent me a, one of those emails about how it was the sort of Nigerian prince scam, oh. but it wasn't a Nigerian prince. It was some banker from Brazil. And claiming that a relative of mine had left me 15 million euros. And in order to make sure that I got it, they wanted to split it with me and so on. Okay. Instead of just putting it in the trash, I decided to write a very long letter to this person about how, oh my Lord, good news. The great uncle you're talking about, he is alive and well. He has not died. He's sitting right next to me as I write this email. And then I go on to describe his adventures. And how he had amassed the fortune that she's talking about, the Moluccan pirates, and the fact that he was, during the Korean War, he'd actually taken one of Kim Il-sung's bodyguards hostage. And just this rambling four-paragraph letter about, so you needn't fear, I'm sorry that you won't get half the money, but neither will I, and just know that it will be spent well in a life of adventure, and, and so forth. Okay, so I got to the end of this, this thing, and I thought, they probably won't read it. But instead of being angry over this, I've now, I've got a kind of weird air under my wings this morning. <laughs> Just that I put that in the universe. I love that. What a great thing. What a great thing. We can make choices like that. We can make those choices in every yeah. experience that comes to us. Oh, I've got another one to tell you that is fabulous. <laughs> go for it. Go. Okay. So I was remembering it because I was doing these Lexus videos. And this is one of the things I was doing, which was they're very big on customer service. They are very dedicated to making the experience a delightful one for you. And you can imagine how hard that is to do when you're buying a car. It's a, oftentimes it's a, it's the Bataan death march. It's just a slog through paperwork and attempts to get you to finance it, et cetera. So they had asked me if I could give some good examples of, of above and beyond service. And when my wife and I were, when we were first got married, we spent our honeymoon in Banff, Canada and did a little skiing up there. There was this little restaurant called Le Beaujolais. And you, in Los Angeles and New York, much of the time, the server is actually an actor or a songwriter or a screenwriter. Or it's the wait, waiting tables is not a profession to them. It is a it's a side hustle so that they can it's do their, pattern, their, right? their, yeah, <laughs> often, oftentimes they're very charming and so forth and certainly good looking. But in this case, this guy was a professional waiter. There was, 
in the, in the old fashioned French tradition, he was a professional and there we were in, in Canada and we go into Le Beaujolais and he had this astonishing mix of friendliness and formality. It was just exactly the sweet spot of having an elevated experience, but human and loving. And you'd been invited into their restaurant, so they were going to treat you like a guest in their home. It's, an, it's a magic trick to, to strike that right thing. But his And he had a series of magic tricks, one of which was that when you didn't need him, he was absolutely nowhere to be seen. He was a ghost. He was a memory. But when you did need him, he was like a gin. He would appear from nowhere. I dropped a spoon. I'm telling you, there was nobody else in the room but my wife. But I, I dropped a spoon. I reached down to pick it up. When I re-came up, he was standing there with a spoon. And he did one of these. And he just goes, he takes my spoon. And then he gives me the spoon. And I'm like, and he gives me this little wink. Like, and all I can think is he must have seen me. He must have seen it teetering somehow. And he and and because he's a professional, he's he's going to wait. He's going to wait. He's going to wait, and then he's going to jump out for the opportunity to perform this magic trick. But the best of all, the best of all the magic tricks was he shows up at the end of the meal just when I'm ready to settle up, and he brings this fabulous cherry dessert, and he says for the newlyweds, and I thought I don't remember telling him we were newlyweds, and I don't think my wife had told him. This never came up. And I said, I said, newlyweds. And he says, yes. And I said, how do you know we're newlyweds? And he goes, please, monsieur, you are, you not? Yes, we are. Okay. So he gives us this beautiful cherry clatou, what is it, clafouti? And I said at the end, I go, you have to tell me how you knew we were newlyweds. He goes, I didn't know. But if I'm wrong, it's a great compliment to her. And I thought, oh, you're a genius. You're a genius. He's he, What he's done is he's crafted the whole evening to be an act, to be a little play. Yeah. And he's found over the course of his professional years that he probably made the mistake of claiming of thinking somebody was newlyweds only to discover that even though he was wrong, they took it as a compliment. Mm -hmm. So now in order to make our evening, he's decided to break that one out. He was a pro, but I, the way I want to apply this in the Lexus example is to say the car is the food, but the experience is the story. Right. And he just, the fact that I can even remember the name of that restaurant 34 years later is exclusively because of him. Right. He puts you into that experience. Yeah. And that's and what we're here to do is have experiences. So why yeah. not make them as rich as we possibly can? Yeah, he was the opposite of the he was the opposite of a snob. He wanted to express an affection for the customers. Mm. He was the experience was a loving experience. And by the way, he did something else that was very impressive, which is at no point during the evening do you ever get the sense that your status is above his status. He's serving, but he's not servile. This is the secret of a professional, I think, a professional detective or a professional woodworker. They have their status is no lower than yours, even though you're paying the bill. No, I'm here to, I'm here to act as a professional. I'm here to do something you can't do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in doing so, there's a pride. And in the pride comes the letting go and being sweet about it. Mm -hmm. Insecurity, I think, is a real, it's why people get upset. Is mm -hmm. They're insecure and you've touched a raw nerve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. You know that feeling. You know how amazing it feels when you attend an in-person event like a party or a concert or something really cool with other people. And the energy in the room is just off the charts. There's nothing like being in a room with other people who are elevated and you feel like a million bucks. You're just rising to the point of wanting to go out there and conquer the world. That is exactly the state of mind you will have at my inaugural event, Rich Thinking, coming up this September 6th 
2024 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. My partner, Renee V and I, cannot wait to bring you a phenomenal lineup of internationally known speakers that will have you on the edge of your seat, feeding your soul and lighting your brain on fire. Mindset and networking are the keys to growth and success and people in the know know how to get into the right rooms. The most successful people are regularly attending these kinds of events. You've seen them online some of them costing many thousands of dollars, which is why we wanted to bring you something affordable and very high level. So it's accessible for everyone because everyone is a VIP at Rich Thinking. In my world, everyone is always a VIP. So visit richthinking.org for more information and to purchase tickets. This one is going to sell out quickly. So grab your tickets today. I cannot wait to see you there, and I'm going to give you the biggest hug and introduce you to all of the best people. Now, get ready for this week's amazing guest. Wow, it's so interesting that you just have all of these experiences. What really strikes me about it is, are these things really happening to you and in your life more than anyone else? Or do we all have these things, these experiences, but maybe we we just don't notice them? So let's go back to what I was saying before about Los Angeles and New York and Washington, D.C. and and Miami and Dallas and Chicago. These are, they are canvases, they're murals. Mm. And you have to let, you have to see the whole mural. And because I was in advertising, I was always looking for a story to tell. And you become, pretty soon you just become a kind of you're not looking at life the same way as a civilian. You're looking for the ideas. And I think that's why I think people in advertising, generally speaking, love a melting pot culture. They love cultures and because it gives you the chance to see things with fresh eyes and see things a different way. And because you need to have this parade of ideas all the time, you stop thinking of it as a transaction. Like the only reason I'm in, I'm interested in this is because I can use a good idea. No, after a while, you just, you grow to really associate. Oh, that was a great moment. That was a great moment. So we're all having these experiences all the time. It's a question of, are you embracing? Mm. Are you em- embracing even the bad ones to see? Maybe there's a learning from this. My daughter's really good at that. <laughs> she gets, she's a, she produces for content creator in Manhattan Beach, very big content creator. And they'll have something like, okay, the flight didn't leave on time, which means we're going to have to adapt and find a new flight. She's always looking for the silver lining. Okay, boss, there must be something in the Charles de Gaulle airport that you're meant to see. All right, you relax. I'll get this taken care of. Get your eyes and ears open. Look for why you're still there. Yeah. That's a, at 23, to have that attitude, you're, you're miles ahead. That's true. But she has you as a dad. <laughs> yeah, but I can't say she gave me that more than I've given her that. I think she came out of the womb. She, You know how it is? Like my son resembles very much his Uncle Mike. And my wife looks very much like her one of her grandfathers, but in a good way. She got all his best traits. And... My daughter, I think, inherited her best. My sisters, I think, she got a lot of her best qualities from the best qualities of my sisters. You can just see it. The equanimity of my sister, Trish, the ability to just go, all right, that happened, moving on. And then my sister, Lily, is very funny. And she's the real storyteller of the family. Really? Um, God, she used to be able to spin a yarn. Oh, That's so cool. Do you just have the two sisters? Three sisters, Mary, Lily, and Trish. And then I was the baby. And Good baby. each of them is so radically different. They're just so different from one another. Mary's very studious and intellectual and philosophical. And Lily is just a laugh riot. And, and then Trish is the whirling dervish of business. She's just a, a flywheel of business acumen. And it's that grit, that ability to see almost every problem as a, as a potential opportunity. Yeah. That's really, you know, but she's a force of nature. Do you think that there's always something bigger at work in our experiences? Open to that. I'm certainly open to that. I, I'll tell you something that I don't know, but I will tell you this. 
how much fun it is to meet a friend you didn't know you had. There's this group of guys up in Wyoming. My pop was born in Casper, Wyoming, and had to move to Los Angeles because of the depression. Now, because of I've always had this sort of soft spot for my dad and how he grew up and like pictures of him when he was about six with this big mop of platinum blonde hair. And they used to call him Whitey. And Whitey Ford was a pitcher for the Yankees back in the, I don't know, the 40s. So they used to call him Whitey Ford. And I, I had these cats reach out to me from Sheridan, Wyoming. And they said, oh, we saw this video, the one that where the punchline is, there is no tiger. And one of these guys had gotten a tattoo that said, there is no tiger. So they emailed it to me. And we wound up in conversation. And the next thing I'm flying out there to Sheridan <laughs> to see these guys, because it's just such a gas to be able to meet people who have, despite we're not part of the same age cohort at all, but we all just have a kind of a spiritual, we're vibing on the same frequency. Oh my God, Mitzi, what a laugh riot, just such fun. And they do this motorcycle trip every year between Devil's Tower and Yellowstone. They call it the Devil's Stone Run. So I jumped in and was part of that. And it's, was that meant to be? Is that a bigger hand at work? I don't know, but I'm going to, I'm certainly going to embrace it. And such a cast of characters, these fellas, they are Josh and Brett and Dan and Rhett and Brady. How, how are these for names? I love it. And the it's, fact that you could just, this is something that you should embrace. And I've done this recently in my own life is like meeting people that are essentially strangers or people you meet online can be so powerfully yeah. like beautiful in your life. And just yeah. trusting that if you feel that vibe, I've had, I've one of, one of my very best friends is someone I met and just felt the vibe with. And I thought, oh, I want to, I want to be with that woman. And we got together and just became friends. And the next thing I know, we became friends in a class we were taking. The next thing I know, she's inviting me to her house in San Diego and I'm going there like once a year for 10 years, 20 years. Yeah. But it's just, it's crazy when things like that happen. This so, is a, this is I the gift of, of TikTok enabled. I would say that probably four of my, five of my closest business associates and confidants and so forth are all as a result of TikTok. Isn't that crazy? It There's this crazy. guy, David Averin, he's an author and Renee Rodriguez. They're both uh, best-selling authors and they reached out to me because of TikTok and they are the most, they're the most generous, intelligent. They give me lots of business advice on maybe you might think about doing this and you might do that. And they've just been so generous with their time. Who knew social media, its promise was this, this was its promise. And, but there is a dark side. And I would say that you are part of the solution, Mitzi, because what you're doing is you're trying to encourage people to find the bigger, the better frequencies to be on. There's so much negativity. If you keep wolfing it down, don't do that. There's, there is a whole palette of colors on TikTok and YouTube and Instagram, just waiting to be appreciated, but you can't, you can't stuff your stomach with the junk food. You have to go out and you have to find the emotional nutrition. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason, part of the way you do that is the message you're sending into the universe is the very nutrition that you seek out. Sure. Like it's not accidental that you and I are talking because it's, no. we're on the same wavelength of we're looking for the good. And when you're out there looking for it, it'll show itself. Yeah, I know. I'm almost wanting to change that old adage, don't talk to strangers and just take away the don't, cross out the big don't and say, talk yeah. to strangers. Did you see that video that I did about, it's called Musk Oxen of New York? And, uh, okay, so the story, find that one. the story goes like this for the benefit of your readers uh, or your listeners. I, when I first got to New York and was working there, people used to come up and ask me for directions all the time. This is the benefit of being from out of town because you don't have that New York look like I'm very busy and I'm on my way somewhere and I don't have time for you. Instead, as an Angelino, I'm looking up at the buildings, <laughs> which is absurd, right? What, what New Yorker looks up at the skyscrapers? Nobody does that. So people used to come up and ask me for directions all the time. And because we were working on the border of the West Village and Soho, the West Village is like a maze. So people are always lost. So I was only too happy to provide directions. After about maybe six months, I started to notice that there were fewer people asking me for directions. And this one woman said, you New Yorkers are a lot friendlier than I was told. And I thought, I'm a New Yorker. And then eventually, when people stopped asking me for directions at all, I thought, oh, 
maybe I am a New Yorker now. And right around this time, I was on, it was one of these chilly, bright winter days. Uh, I was on a cor- street corner on Canal. And all of a sudden, and it's a typical street corner. It's the cross section of New York, right? Here's the Orthodox Jew standing next to a Sikh, standing next to Rastafarian, standing next to me, and I'm in a business suit. And, it's, and then there's this dude next to me in a full hip hop. <laughs> and all of a sudden, there is a three year old girl walking along the street by herself. And all of us at once were terrified for this little girl. And we all involuntarily created this kind of cordon of safety. Rather, keep her from getting the street. Oh, where's your mother? And, and then her, the mother, not long after, the mother comes frantically out of the subway. She had lost, no doubt she was like recharging a card or something. And then the kid just wandered off. And she comes upon us. And men and women of every age and every description were all in hugely relieved. And she, the, the woman was terrified that her child had been in danger. And in that moment, I remember thinking, really thinking, lady, this kid was safer on this city street than anywhere else on earth because there's, she's surrounded by New Yorkers. There's no way we're going to let anything happen to this kid. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. for all of its reputation as a crime laden ridden, you know, cesspool. New Yorkers are effing fantastic, yeah. right? And they're all devoted to kids and they're all incredibly protective and they're all incredibly proud of being from New York. They wouldn't dream of letting anything happen to that child. When in their tough demeanor, they're going to make sure. So it struck me just in that moment, as I was standing on the screen and I looked over at the guy in the hip hop stuff And I looked at him and I could tell he was thinking the same thing I was thinking, which isn't it great? It isn't a great city. And he gave me a fist bump. And I thought, now I'm a New Yorker. Now I'm a real New Yorker. And at the end of the story that I tell this, which is true, I went out and I bought a New York Yankees hat and I hate the Yankees. (laughs) We're just so proud of New York in that moment. Oh my God. It's the, it's the, yeah. Anyway. That's amazing. That's amazing. Your stories are just fantastic. And I think that everyone, if you have not listened to Neil's stories, you must go and seek him out on TikTok or on any other platform and, and listen to his story. So and Neil, can I, I give have... a can I yeah, give a commercial? Ahead. Can I do a yeah, commercial? Yeah, you can. Uh because I'm I come up with a program. It's yes. that's it's called Storyfire, and you can reach it on www.storyfire.net.net, right? Storyfire.net. And what it is, it's video modules on basically how to tell stories. And it's intended originally, it's a course I used to teach largely back when I was in advertising on how to present work. And so this is the result of thousands and thousands of presentations trying to persuade people and influence them. And so it's all the tips and tricks I learned over the course of 30 year career. And there are three tiers of it. So I highly recommend that if you're interested in learning the art form, I've got a couple of samples on there that you can watch for free. And there you go. Thank you for the opportunity to pitch that, Mitzi. Oh, gosh, of course. It's an amazing program. I haven't taken it myself yet, but I am super interested in storytelling. And I have been a writing professor and an English professor for over 25 years in my other life, in my previous life. That is something that is right up my alley. Well, it's just full in business. And it's, yeah. it's something that I'm finding out now as an entrepreneur, storytelling and how essential it is in marketing and in business. And it's just, and also just in life, like being a good storyteller makes you an interesting person. It makes you magnetic. It helps to amplify your charisma. Yeah. There's a, the, the part that people find as an unexpected dividend is that once they start getting involved in the course and they start thinking like a storyteller, then all of a sudden life starts showing them all, they start looking at things and going, Oh, Yes, that veterinarian, she was great. That was a moment. Mm -hmm. And there's something really delicious about going through life like somebody who's going to report on this later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just having, when you have an experience, saying to yourself, wow, that was something. And I know Mm -hmm. a lot of people will write them, write these moments down. And I think that's a really good practice. Just if something happens to you and you want to remember it, take out your phone, write it in a note. It's such a a great way of going through life and learning how to notice, learning how to see, learning how to be. And I love your whole sentiment about just embracing the good, noticing the good and 
looking at the statistics, it's a numbers game. There's way more good than bad. There, exactly. It's statistically, it's vastly bigger the good things that happen to the bad things. We have to don't be look, that. Don't be yeah. looking for the slights. Turn off uh, the news. Turn off the really, truly. Turn literally, off I have news. turned it off. It's turn it's it of off. Life, but it's not. They have demonstrated to a fact that the more news you listen to, the worse informed you are. And, um, but I will, I'll, let me add something else, which is that the dividend of recording your stories, writing them down or delivering them is that you, your children, if you have children or your nieces and nephews or your other friends, they will have a record of you that will become precious to them someday. My father uh, never knew my daughter. And it is one of the great sadnesses of my life that my son and my daughter never knew their granddad, my dad. I think he would have delighted in them. And I wish they knew him. And if they, if he had written down some of these things, if he had told some of these stories about what it was like in the Navy in World War II and during the Depression, and what was it like being an architect in 1949 in Los Angeles and driving a red Pontiac convertible? What was that like? I really wish they would have benefited from knowing what kind of person he was. And so we owe it, we owe it to our own children or our nieces and nephews, et cetera, to give them some impression of who you were. Yeah. Now I do have one last question, but before I ask you that, I have to, if you can give me another two minutes, that would be great. And I, um, okay. (laughs) I do want to say though, that was my original intention when I started this podcast was more about life stories and telling the extraordinary stories of ordinary people. Uh And it began to evolve from there because I began to speak to other people who had very strong messages they wanted to get out in the world. But I always had the dream of creating a global repository for life stories, like almost like a whole, like in star Wars, the hologram of the person, like there Uh, would be a place where you could leave your life. You just, you spin the ring and then, and then future people could see it. What was life really? Because we have no idea what life was really like in, in our world. In even in the past, whatever hundred years or so, a lot of those things have been lost. Very interesting. And I love that. All right. So here's my final question because it's the Blessings Podcast. Mm. What are the biggest lessons that you have learned in your life? Self control is a gift to yourself that if I had grasped earlier, my life would have been so much better if I had learned to control my, not only my, to not get so elated over things and blow them out of proportion, to just, have a little more control over myself Mm. and it's a gift to every, it's a gift to yourself, but it's a gift to the others around you who they don't want to see you in pain or they don't want to see you flame out. And I, I now look back at all of the, my wife is very long suffering to have put up with these. I would get upset over being lost or I would get upset over some bank charge to the point where I'm tearing the bill up that kind of thing, that sort of furiousness. It's so stupid. And I'm going to pull out a quote now for you, which is one of the lessons. Life is a shipwreck, but we must remember to sing in the lifeboats. That is, I love that sentiment that just enjoy it where you can. And the, I think maybe the biggest lesson that I'm learning now, and it's a bit late in the day is the proportion of good people to bad is so weighted on the side of good. And you can help people a lot by assuming good for them. Don't get upset with them. Yeah. I don't know if you've had this experience, Mitzi, if when you lose your temper, who do you think is the big loser here? Do you think it's you? Always. You're the one that now has to live with the guilt of having upset everybody and being furious. It, you have to apologize later. You have, you're embarrassed and so forth. Maybe just give a gift to yourself of recognizing the signs that you're getting upset over something and trying desperately to remind yourself, there's got to be a silver lining here that I'm not thinking of. There's always a silver lining. The people that I talk to that have been through the worst experiences are often those who have the brightest outlook on life. Mm. Yeah. It was a catalyst for self-discovery. That Yes, exactly. And what about your blessings? What, are, what would you say are your biggest blessings? I think it was the patience of 
my spouse, we've been married 34 years. And I can say with, I can say with some sincerity that there are reasons I love her more now than at the beginning because she was, she brought out the best in me. Not everybody gets that. It's a real crapshoot. Marriage is a crapshoot and it doesn't have great odds. So that's a real blessing. And if I had to trade them all in, you know, that would be one, meaning I would trade them for that. And then another blessing is that um, despite my own flaws, people have, have forgiven me. And it's a glorious thing to have friends that like, don't, that they accept the, that you're human. Mm-hmm. I, it's really quite astonishing to, to think if you look at a photo from say 1870s Japan, and they would have had cameras by then. And they're shooting these pictures of like former ninjas and, and geishas and all this stuff. And what you'll come across every once in a while is there will be a photo from 1870 that shows some geisha making a funny face or they're mugging for the camera. Some guy who is apparently a, what do they call the Japanese soldiers back then? They had a word for it. But anyway, these dour, incredibly dignified people. And then they would be making this funny face like, and you're thinking, you know what? People haven't changed in 30,000 years. People haven't changed. So you got to stop thinking that you can't learn stuff from the past, from the ancient wisdom of, I really think people think they're smarter than their than previous generations. And they're so misinformed. I had yeah. this, I had the experience of reading Brothers Karamazov, which was written about 1865 or 70. It's Russia in 1870. And it reads like it was written yesterday. The circumstances are different. But the people are all the same. It's the same comedy of stupid. Because we're not learning our lessons. We're We're not learning our lessons. Come on, people. (laughs) And it it demonstrates an acumen of capturing the human comedy in such a way where you just go, wow, we really need to be more generous with each other about grant each other a little more grace. Because, look, this is a team sport, okay? You get ahead when you're a good teammate. And don't think you're all, you're not in this alone, man. You're loneliness is so self-inflicted mm. and I just can't get over the fact that nothing's changed <laughs> in all that time. So you got to have patience with your parents and you got, and your kids have to have patience with you because it's, Hey man, you do exactly what I did. If you gone through what I went through. It's be, you'd be the same person. I really have very little patience for people that have, that are upset with Gen Z. I've got no, I've got no, no sympathy for you. Trust me when I tell you, brother, you'd be doing exactly the same thing they're doing if you grew up under their circumstances. And you know what? They'd be doing the same thing as you if they grew up under your circumstances, because people don't change. So don't act like they're some kind of new waste of space. All right. There's a reason that they act the way they do and grant a little license. Just ask yourself, why are they behaving this way? Not, oh my Lord. Yeah. It's we're a, all going through it at the same time. Right, I, my, right. my daughter just sent me this little meme that said something like, remember your mother is doing this for the first time too. give her a little, yeah. cut her a little slack. Yeah. <laughs> She's realizing that now yeah. at this point in her life. That's all the that's all the more reason why people's generosity with each other is extraordinary and should be celebrated to me. The fact that my wife's patience is so gracious and above and beyond. Oh my God, Mitzi, I cringe at some of the things I've said. Oh. It's hard for me to imagine that side of you because your public persona is so measured. Your voice is very calm and very soothing. So I get upset over dumb stuff. I get, yeah. I flame out over dumb stuff. Why do you um, think that is? Because of okay. insecurity. That's a, the videos that I'm doing are as much to, so that I hear it mm-hmm. as anybody. The healer also yeah. needs healing. I, I just, I need to hear, I need to be reminded. And there's something else that's wonderful, which is that when people reach out to me because of these messages, they're feeding back to me that same energy. So it helps me live in that spirit. Yeah. Yeah. And then it becomes an upward spiral. And that's yeah. a beautiful thing. I do lament that I have no answer for 
when people are not good at, when they're not good to one another, but are not good at scale, Ukraine and West, and West Bank, Gaza, et cetera, et cetera. If you want to find bad stuff happening to people, you don't have to go very far. Like we can't dwell there in the negativity. We no, because it perpetuates that vibration. And yeah, we, right. we want to change that. We want to have a shift to the positive, And that will help to resolve a lot of these things that are happening in the world. Yeah, Thank you, I, Neil. I, that's been my I pleasure. Just, it's oh it's good gosh, to meet you. I, yeah, it's so good to meet you. And thanks again. I've, I've loved talking to you. I feel like we could talk for a lot longer. We most certainly could. I got the evidence I will tell you is from shared in Wyoming where we only meet on a Zoom call. And the next thing you know, I'm up there and we're like brothers. Next time you're on the East Coast, you got to let me know. Where are, where are, whereabouts are you right now? Like I'm where, in Pennsylvania right now. Yes. What, what part? Because in, in like the Lehigh Valley. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Granton slice. Uh, you know, more near Stroudsburg, Allentown in between yeah, okay. that area. Yeah. East in Bethlehem. I'm closer yeah, to like. Sp- I spent a good chunk of the time on the, on, on sort of. Northwest New York. and Were you born on the East Coast or the West Coast? I was a California baby. I was born okay. in San Diego, lived a good chunk in the Bay Area, and then moved to Los Angeles. I think I'm so impressed by Los Angeles. I think it. I think its image doesn't even begin to tell the story of what's going on here about the subcultures. I think you could make an endless series about this town and how vibrant and colorful and alive and ambitious and intelligent it is it's crazy the opportunity in this town hmm. um yeah i've I never no- been to los angeles i've only ever been to san diego and yeah san diego and south and in uh, california yeah la is um uh, la which is a los angeles county <laughs> is this unbelievable population that is, I think Los Angeles County is bigger than about, uh, the population of LA County is bigger than something like 26 states of the union. Hmm. And yeah, it's gigantor. And how much time do you have? Do you have Long three time. minutes? Yeah. Do you want me okay. to stop? I can, we can stop recording though. <laughs> you, you can feel free to record this. Because All right. I let's think, keep think, it rolling. Maybe I'll find something. Yes. Definitely. I think, yeah, you don't know. As think, long as but, you don't mind. Yeah. Let's keep it rolling. I want to tell you about one of the, this is a typical Los Angeles This is absolutely Los Angeles to the core. All right. The arts district is just south of downtown. And downtown, there's East LA and there's West LA. And the dividing line is approximately the 110 freeway, which goes from the port of Los Angeles north to downtown. Plus, people most don't realize Los Angeles County resembles flowers in a vase because it goes up here's downtown. And the larger environs of Los Angeles, which includes South Central LA. But then there's this long corridor, which is the LA River. And it, it is still LA, or I should say it's still LA City. And then it spills out to the port of Los Angeles. And that's the bottom of the base. And the reason, obviously, that LA City wants to control the port is all of the commerce of Los Angeles flows through this. And so they, when it was originally founded, they wanted to make sure that that was governed by the city. In very typical fashion, COVID comes along and it's killing the restaurants. And it's killing the arts. It's killing the art galleries. Then they start to spill the the population out onto the sidewalks to accommodate COVID, but you can keep the restaurants open. Well, eating al fresco in Los Angeles is fantastic because the weather is good most of the time. So, you know, we're all out there eating. And then they came up with this. The restaurants were getting killed by the, they weren't selling a lot of booze like they used to because there was, the traffic was down. So they started saying, wait a minute, what if we created the late lunch, early dinner? Like instead of closing after lunch at two and then reopening at six, what if it's just, we just keep it open and we start the booze flowing at two o'clock. Like we, it's aggressive drinking, (laughs) happy hour two. Why would you do that? We got to get them going. We got to get them sluiced up. And the idea was, I want to keep this restaurant populated between lunch and dinner. I want to get I want to get a late lunch and early dinner. And what happened was, in the arts district, it's fantastic because you do a lot of business down there under the right circumstances. It's a great environment. It's colorful. It's fun. It's filled with hipsters. And 
What's more, I like this late lunch idea because instead of going, Ricky, I'll meet you for lunch at 1130 so we'll avoid the crowd, they've spread that out. And now we pitch up at 12, talk about our film project, and then just start getting bombed. And it's all on the country, right? It's all on the company arm, right? There you go. Because it's, it's lunch, right? Yep. So, okay. So the return of the three martini lunch. And then you go, you know what? Let's not wait for dinner at six. Let's go to dinner at four. And when we come out at six, it's still daylight. It's fantastic. Here's what, here was the dividend. The dividend of this creativity is that the galleries started to notice that people were wandering down the street a little bit lit and they were buying stuff because they're going, I want two of those and one of that and, <laughs> and I'll take three of those. Margaret, what do you like? What do you like? <laughs> I like the sculpture. Sculpture for you. <laughs> so the galleries are going, wait a minute, this is a discovery. So they're partnering up now with all the restaurants and going, yeah, we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to spill the gallery out on the street. It makes it nice for you makes it nice for us. It looks like something's going on. So it, it attracts people. Okay. Then, and this was my favorite part of it. A lot of the East LA art scene, the sort of, it's a new thing. It's, it's LA hip hop, which is, it's got a Vato kind of vibe. It's graffiti and it's music and it's lowriders and it's bikes and it's customized. And what they would do is they would take advantage of the fact that the parking lot sidewalks would get a lot of this traffic coming back from the restaurants. So they would they started doing these pop-ups, awnings and tables. And the artists from East LA would come in with their graffiti art on cards and they had greeting cards and spray-painted t-shirts and hats and pins. And the thing was, yeah, I could drop three grand or five grand on that sort of minor painting in there, or I can buy out this guy's whole inventory of interesting stuff for $500. Like the whole thing, just get how much for the whole box, right? I want all your paintings. I want your drawings. I want, and just to give you an idea about how incredibly vibrant this was, there's this young cat I bought, I think I must've bought about six of his paintings. He had this little logo that was a uh, single sided razor blade. That It was a little thing. He used to just be able to snap it out. And there it was. It was this little logo of this razor blade. I said, oh man, that's a badass logo. What's the story behind that? And without flinching at all, he goes, oh yeah, I used to do a lot of self-harm. I'm like, what? And he says, yeah, this and that. And I got, and I got into a bad scene and I got into drugs and blah, blah, blah. And he goes, and my, the logo was a way of me owning this so it didn't control me. Now I wasn't running away from it anymore. I was just going, that was a piece of me. It's not anymore. I emerged. Now it's not me. I can shield myself from it or I can embrace it and say that happened. And I'm like, dude, how much for the whole box? Exactly. And that to me was so emblematic of LA. Mm -hmm. Like these cultures that would not have rubbed up against one another. Now they're all living in the same milieu. And what's more, I have no doubt that those gallery guys are now, they're patrolling these things and they're looking for the next, next Basquiat. Mm. Well, and no doubt they'll find her mm -hmm. or him. Mm -hmm. And it's glorious to, you come out, you've had a couple of Proseccos and you're on the sidewalk and you can't drive yet. You got to work it out. So you're patrolling the sidewalk and doing the street fair and meeting people and everybody's got a website. So you're, they've all got the QR code up and people are commissioning stuff. They're right there and they're going, Hey, could you do one that had this? Could you do one of my dog? And they're going, fucking, Hey man, absolutely. I'll be happy to, do you want a painting? Do you want to, I'll go back and I'll do it for you. And that to me is, it, it goes back to what I was saying before about it. it's not business, it's trade. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's opportunities. And this, I, I'm reading the, I have a book club and I'm reading the book, Think and Grow Rich with my book club. I lead it. Mm. And one of the things in the book, Holy and Hill. I mean, it's a classic, you know, classic, but one of the things he talks about there in the book is to put yourself where opportunity can see you. You got to put uh. yourself where your dreams can see you, you got to mm. be there. And you can, and that means immerse yourself, be there, just be in the, in the moment. And, yeah. Uh, Here's my suspicion that 
that this sous chef in the restaurant lives in East LA. And he says mm-hmm. to his cousin, these galleries are, they're killing it. I bet if you came down and did a pop-up by the parking lot, they, you could sell some of this stuff. And man, the word spreads. And you know what? There's a bizarre, I, I know you know how this works. But it's like, why did they put all the car dealers on the same auto row? Yeah. Doesn't that, now aren't they all in competition with one another? For reasons that are difficult to explain, having all the car dealers in one place actually stimulates more car traffic. Right. By having more artists on the street, each individual artist actually in both the aggregate and the average does better business. Better for everyone. It's better for everybody. And the place just went, uh, it was COVID. Who knew? It was because of COVID. They invented mm-hmm. a meal and they created a brand new art gallery for 0% property tax. They just, <laughs> right? There's no brick and mortar. California will a, find a way. To- a, uh, yeah, they might still. <laughs> Yeah. And there was a lot of cash and there was a lot yes, of cash going down, yes, yes. but God bless them because it was improving the experience for everybody. Mm-hmm. Everybody was alive because yeah. the, and the galleries are not looking on this as competition. It's not the same thing. The galleries curate, they select your, you don't have to weed through the boxes. No, no, this is where it's at. But I have no doubt in my mind that the next Basquiat of those galleries that they're going to, somebody's about to be a star mm. because of that mashup and it will be worth it because it's not vacuous. It's stories are being told here. There's creativity going on and it's like what the razor blade logo is. This is exactly what art is supposed to do. Art is supposed to heal. Mm-hmm. It's supposed to, it's supposed to exchange ideas and sentiments and say, you're not alone. We're in this together. Yeah. and. This is my experience and I want you to share it. That's right. Art is not flat. Art is life. It's alive. You ever heard that Ethan Hawke monologue on the meaning of art? Um, no. It's really good. It's really super good. I don't happen to be a great fan of his work, but I'm a huge fan of him as a person. Okay. He's just such a thoughtful, creative. He's a searcher. He's always looking for new ideas. He worked with Paul Schrader, the guy that wrote taxi driver. And so he's traveling in circles of very thoughtful, philosophical people. Mm-hmm. And his monologue about art is, was I won't spoil it by previewing it. I would only do a botch job on it. Just look it up. I and will. I'm something being summoned. So I'm going to yeah, have to Yeah, that's fine. No, thank but, uh, you. Thank you again, Neil. I, uh, I love pleasure to speaking you. with you and uh, yeah, let's keep in touch. I, right. I really love talking to you. Back at you. And I love what you got going on. 